Just a quick word of warning before we get going that the following podcast will almost certainly contain spoilers and may also contain strong language and conversations of an adult nature. Welcome to episode 12 of Strong Language and Violent Scenes, the podcast, giving a second chance to films that might not deserve them. I'm Mitch Bain, I am a horror writer and an occasional doer of musical things. And I'm Andy Stewart, and I make disgusting films and stuff like that. You sure <laughs> do. And uh, joining us tonight, delight- delighted to be joined by another guest coming in on the Skype. You know him best as a filmmaker, musician, magazine publisher, former editor-in-chief of Fangoria magazine, and also co-founder and current editor-in-chief of Delirium magazine, Mr. Chris Alexander. Chris, thanks for joining us. Thank you, boys. I, I appreciate it. Any time to talk about my, one of my favorite movies of all time uh, is is a good time to me. So, so thanks very much. And it is um, a hell of a selection that you've made tonight. Yeah. Um, heading back to 1972, 1972, William Crane's uh, Blackula. Yeah, the the, yeah. the heady days of 1972. What a film? <laughs> yeah, I think um, I think the best place to start, um, Chris, is just to ask you a little bit about why you chose it. Well, you know, I, I know the beat of your show, and that is, this is kind of, uh, you know, uh, horror court or cult movie court. We're kind of going uh, on the defense for uh, some of these movies. I don't think Blackula necessarily at this point in its life needs much defending, generally speaking. I mean, I think it's woven so deeply into the fabric of uh, cult movie fandom that uh, everybody's aware of Blackula, and, and at least it gives it a kind of begrudging respect. Um, but it's still a movie that gets, you know, blown full of holes when it comes to making fun of it. I mean, the title alone begs for that. I guess The Simpsons <laughs> did an episode, you know, where Homer, I think it's Homer watching television. And uh, they're like, coming up next, Blackie Love, followed by Blackenstein, and then the Blunch Black of Blue Blame. Blame. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's okay. It's fair game. It's called Blackie Love. It's, you're going to laugh. But, I mean, there's such a, it, you know, it's everything, like, I think every, every good cult movie, horror movie needs about 20 years to become what it's going to become, where we can kind of remove ourselves from the zeitgeist. And, and look at it uh, pro- uh, properly, and I think when we look back at a film like Blackula, um, it's it speaks so deftly of its time uh, yeah. that it, I think it's an important movie. A and B. I also think uh, you know cinematically, it's also more sophisticated than a lot of people realize. And I guess we'll get into the guts of that later. But no, it's always been one of my favorite um, favorite vampire movies. Not just a movie I, I watch with a tongue firmly in cheek, although there's those moments. <laughs> but I really think it is a, a genuinely kind of uh, trailblazing vampire film. I'm inclined to agree with that. Yeah, same. And I think like yeah, you've hit on something <clears throat> there as well, where I think that like it's really difficult to speak to the legacy of, of a film until a little bit of time's passed. Yeah, I mean, when Blackula was released, obviously, you know, historically. We know the uh, the dawn of the '70s in American cinema. You know, it was the death of the old guard, the uh, the birth of the new, uh, violence, sex, post Vietnam. You know, we've heard that academics rhapsodize endlessly about that changing of the guard in, in American cinema, and she and chiefly in American horror and and yeah. action and, and darker genre cinema. Uh, so we know that um, you know you know speaking literally of darker, uh, a more prominent African American presence in in genre movies. Uh, you know, post uh, Melvin Van Peebles' Sweet Sweetback's Badass song and uh, Larry Cohen's Black Caesar, et cetera, et cetera. And then Shaft, we saw that surge in, in quote unquote, black exploitation movies. So, you know, people were surrounded by this stuff. And and critics didn't really, you know, when, when something's so omnipresent in, in the culture, it's really hard to really assess each individual work. You're looking at it as a movement. And when these movies were coming rapid fire to, to theaters and drive ins endlessly, it looked like just another black exploitation movie, and, and Blackula was certainly the first, um, you know, legitimate horror uh, black exploitation movie too. So there was a kind of novelty to it, but you know, critics were not kind, <laughs> and, and understandably so because you know, critics. Look, I was a film critic for many years. I guess I, I will be till I die. But professionally, I always kind of had a self-loathing because when you're a film critic, you're always kind of looking over your shoulder to your peers to see what they're liking and not liking, and. You know, you kind of need brass balls sometimes to stand up and go, actually, this movie's really good and I really liked it, uh, lest you be judged <laughs> by your fellow freaks. So, um, yeah, I, I think a lot of people did not get Blackula, and you do need that time when you can look back at that at that period and, and take some take some time 
to individually assess those movies to really fully appreciate and understand uh, a movie like this. So do you think that like uh, one of the reasons why kind of critics weren't kind to this at the time then is because it was kind of a turn of the tide and it was something that people just didn't know how to respond to? I mean, look, there were so many of these movies and, and not all of them were great. I mean, even even <laughs> seen from a distance. Um, you know, I mean, Blackula was really, critics be damned. I mean, I guess critics have never really mattered when it came to pundits uh, paying the tickets to see the movies because Blackula was very successful. But, you know, Blackula comes out, great. People go to see it. It's, you know, again, coasting on its name and its notoriety. And then uh, Blackenstein comes out, and Blackenstein <laughs> is, you know, in, almost indefensible. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, quite, a, it's a different experience altogether. Yeah, you know, I, I, we should, <laughs> we could have chosen Blackenstein, but I would have, it would have been a very short episode because I'm very forgiving when it comes to most cinema, and I can usually find something. And Blackenstein only exists to ridicule. I mean, it's just a piece of garbage. The story behind <laughs> the scenes of Blackenstein is great because it was kind of, I guess it was funded by the mob, wasn't it? And the guy was executed, the director. Uh, after the movie was made, you know, they found his body riddled with bullets or whatever. But, I mean, that's cool, but the movie itself is shit. So um, a, lot of, a lot of these <laughs> movies the weren't that, yeah, they weren't that great. So uh, you can see how the critics would just be kind of, and they're like that today and they'll be like that forever. They come to the the theater. They come to the screenings. They come to the put the pen to page with uh, kind of preconceptions, um, you know, not open to again experiencing the individual work in and of itself, but coming with their arms crossed, expecting something, and uh, and I'm, I'm also trying to turn a turn a gag once in a while too. And and a movie like it's called Blackula, man. It's uh, <laughs> easy to make fun of right off the bat, you know. Oh. I think critics do have a tendency to paint with broad strokes with things like that, <laughs> and I think that like that yeah. that probably is that probably is true of this by the sounds. So, um, one thing before we get into the meat of this thing, one thing that we always do is Andy, have you got thirty seconds on the clock. Yeah. So, for the benefit of anyone, Chris, who's listening to the episode tonight without having seen the film, uh, if I give you if we give you thirty seconds, your best shot at a thirty second synopsis. Uh, okay, let me think. Uh, right, hang on, wait, wait, wait. Okay, yeah. Three, two, one, go. Okay, William Crane's Blackula tells the tender tale of Prince Mama Walde, an African prince who, who sits down uh, to break bread with Count Dracula, begging him to stop the slave trade, uh, which Dracula sneers, laughs, and in, turn, in return for his insolence puts the bite on him and curses him with the worst, turning him into the dreaded Blackula, entombing him in, a, in his coffin where he is woken up a century later by two homosexual art art directors or art art collectors, <laughs> yep, is yep, that yep. antique collectors, and uh, time and loose upon modern day L.A. Oh. Did I go over my thirty yeah. seconds? Yeah, yeah, but that's Sorry, that's okay. I, we'll make it up. We'll I stumbled, up. I stumbled, I stumbled, I stumbled. But that's, yeah, basically, oh, Chris, again, you're still in the I would say the, the the upper third of people that have done this so far. Yeah, his, oh, his, his, um, that was a high pressure gig, man. I wasn't yeah. anticipating to be put on the spot like that. I'm glad I, I came out sort of okay. We, okay. We had um, uh, Tyler McIntyre on last week and doing Memoirs mm-hmm. of an Invisible Man, and he was completely blindsided by that. Yeah, he. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he recovered, to be fair. Yeah, but no, fine. historically, that segment goes disastrously. So I think, yeah, no, you did pretty well. I would like oh, okay. to. I would like to kick off, kick things off by talking about American International. Yeah. I get a little thrill every time i see that american international logo come up at the start of anything me too. Me too. um so for me right away i'm like this might not be the best film ever made but i know i'm gonna have a good time watching it um and they yeah, put that- yeah I, I agree especially during that period i mean it was interesting everyone was going everyone was throwing darts at the dart- dartboard to see what would stick mm-hmm. and american international obviously being an independent had even a longer leash to do that so you know the post at this point roger corman had kind of split from them and he was starting his own studio new world yeah and american international was kind of going all over the place trying to find a new vincent price and a new roger corman and auditioning new directors and new talent and trying to capitalize on what was going on with the kids today you know and and really just going for broke so during the blackula period man and aip was a in its last legs, kind of, because they didn't, wouldn't last for much longer, a few years. Yeah, I mean, it kind of petered were... out at the start of the eighties, I think. Was yeah. it the start of the eighties? I thought it was. I thought it was. I guess, okay. I guess. Yeah. I guess yeah, I, I think was thinking like seventy seven, seventy eight. But you, you might be right. Yeah. Well, they put. Uh, they certainly put uh, the Incredible Melton Man out, and that was what seventy eight, and that's. Uh, that was yeah, that's, uh, 77, 78. That's yeah. one that. Yeah. I, that's certainly one that I love. Um, but they put yeah, out I love the me- I love that too, and, and I mean that's we could we could have done a show on that one because oh. Rick Baker's special effects are still some of the grossest I've ever seen in any movie. Mm-hmm. God, maybe I'll save that for for you for another episode, Mitch. But it's, sure, it's yeah, I love weird. that. That uh, movie's ridiculous, uh, but I love those again. I, I have a hard time watching that because it's so disgusting. It's, it's so gross. <laughs> wow. 
Uh, but yeah, uh, they they put out some amazing stuff uh, over the over the kind of the duration, and then they they were responsible for putting out some of the bigger kind of black exploitation films that came out around about that time. So they were putting they were putting out stuff like uh, they put out like coffee and again like you mentioned Black Caesar and Foxy Brown and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. So they were kind of. They, they, I think feel that they were kind of leading the charge in black exploitation at the time. Well, because it was the, one thing that they knew how to do, and you know they knew this before Roger Corman became their house director. But certainly Corman really smacked it, smacked them into to shape. Whereas they they knew how to tap into what was was popular and then just ride that for all it was worth as quickly <laughs> as possible before it petered out. Yeah, as so much. That's and why you saw glut, you saw glut of these movies very quickly before people stopped giving a shit. You know, they made their bank. <laughs> And they were ruthless. They were ruthless, too, if I may interject, because, you know, we could maybe go off on this later. But I always attribute, you know, you're throwing in a a Blackula kind of in that mini wave of of great post hammer horror gothic Mm -hmm. contemporary vampire movies, the the Count Yorga movies. And, uh, you know, they were trying to groom uh, Robert Quarry to be the next Vincent Price in those movies. And, you know, Bob Kelgen ended up directing Blackula, too. Mm -hmm. But um, I remember Quarry wanted to go off in his own because he was tired of uh, Nicholson and Arkoff being such pricks <laughs> about Doe. And then he made, he funded his own uh, vampire movie. that was kind of an unofficial Count Yorga movie called the death master. And then AIP got wind of this. And then when production was over, they ended up blindsiding him and buying the movie uh, out from under him and then shelving it and saying, ah, and contractually dragging him back to make another death master movie. And then stealing the title or another Yorga movie and then stealing the title death master and throwing it on as the tagline on the second Yorga movie. So like you didn't, these guys were kind of like, you know, cool movies and everything, but they were kind of, you know, they were kind of like the horror or the cult movie mafia in many respects. (laughs) Ram, uh, just to jump in, just jump straight into this. I want to talk about the pre-credit sequence. Sure. Well, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Like, uh, because on paper, if you were going to describe this to someone, obviously it sounds kind of crazy. But it's uh, <laughs> like you know, uh, you've got Manuel Walde and uh, his wife, partner L- Luva. Yeah. Um, same with Dracula to broker the end of the slave trade. Considering what, how that sounds on paper, this scene kind of it was pretty uncomfortable viewing. I think. Uh, I agree. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uncomfortable, and it's also out of step with the rest of the movie. It's, it really it is really, and not just like thematically, but if you even. It, it, technically, I mean, if you watch that se- sequence uh, again when you're watching the movie, listen to the audio. It's it's terrible. It's, yeah. it's echoey. It's almost like they for, didn't have the. They shot it on the fly and they shot it very quickly. Uh, I think after as, as an afterthought, if I'm not mistaken, because uh, I guess William Marshall was the guy that really pushed to steer the course of, of Blackula to be something a little bit more socially relevant and, mm-hmm. and give it some integrity by making Mama Walde a, a prince as opposed to just some vampiric pimp wandering around L.A., which I think was the original intent. So, Which I the, would also have quite liked to have seen. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I would have too, but yeah, I guess so. I guess so, but it wouldn't have... We went, I don't think we'd be sitting here talking about Blackula these yeah. many years later if it was yeah, that. I, you know. I would agree with that. I feel like uh, putting them kind of on that same kind of level, that kind of aristocracy type level as Dracula, and going into it, I think kind of sets the sets a good tone for him to continue down that path. Yeah, and you know what's cool about that sequence too, if you look at it in the, in the context of just being a Blackula, not just being a fun one shot, an offshoot of a of a bizarre new subgenre, but as a good as a good vampire movie, it's I think it's one of the few times I can think of historically in cinema where Dracula was played as a full blown malevolent evil son of a bitch. I mean, he's always yeah. kind of you know. I mean, is Christopher Lee's Dracula evil? Eh, he's kind of nothing. He's more of a cipher in those Hammer movies. He doesn't really have a purpose except to kind of mince around and bite people and scream. <laughs> but uh, but in this one, you know, Dracula is actually setting this guy up to fuck with him, you yeah. know. And, and he really, it's like, it's, and again, as you say, uncomfortable. It adds this very kind of colonialism element to it and... And, uh, you know, what's his what's Dracula's motive? He's just wicked. I mean, that's it. It's just nothing but spite and, and evil that, that puts him. And that's kind of the way I guess Stoker had written Dracula. And he was romanticized to death yeah. throughout his yeah. run in cinema. But here he's not. He's just an evil son of a bitch. So I think that's kind of interesting. Cool. Another thing that also shows like the cheapness and weirdness of that opening sequence is, you know, the part where Dracula is given his soliloquy justifying the title Blackula, which I'm glad they did that because. Yeah. You know, otherwise, you know, it wouldn't make any sense. But the fact that Dracula himself says, fuck it, you're Blackula. Yeah. But you see his mascara. He's, he's in that sequence. He's, he's, he's got heavy eye makeup on. Yeah. 
and uh, contacts, I guess. And I guess they're whatever's wrong with him. He's he's reacting badly to the makeup, and his his eyes are pouring he, water. Yeah, yeah he yeah. has um the presume. I think what we're supposed to surmise is that Dracula has drank so much blood from Mamu Waldi that uh, he his body can't contain it, and it's leaking out his eyeballs. Um, but whatever <laughs> the blood is made of, he's having a really hard time with it, and he's he's blinking too much. And yeah, like you say, his eyes are streaming, so he's uh, pretty sure it's not um, proper eye blood. Um, I think it's probably just we'll chuck some syrup in your eyes and hope for the best. Yeah, it, it reminds me of the opening of Hammer's uh, Curse of uh, the Werewolf when you see Oliver Reeves, Reeves' eyes over the credits and he's reacting poorly to the makeup or the contacts and he starts to cry as well, which wasn't supposed to be what, what was happening, but it added this kind of element of pathos to that character that this this crying werewolf kind of set the tone for the movie to follow and i just like the idea although he's reacting badly to the blood and the makeup in his eyes the fact that dracula is so overcome by this he's almost weeping it's just it's something almost religious about that acts that accidental miracle of that that cheap little sequence <laughs> um i think like i think i agree on both counts in that i think that it's really important that that sequence is there and also that yeah there's a lot of things about it that does kind of as part of the film kind of have a little bit of an afterthought quality yeah. to it but i think that you've hit on something interesting there when you talk about kind of how dracula is portrayed because you're right what he actually does to Mamuwali is this unbelievable moment of isolated cruelty that you don't really associate. And, and and not only just insults his his but has tricked him has tricked him into giving him giving uh, you know counsel with him and 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 inviting him into his home and making him seem like there's there's hope and then he just completely rips you know, kicks the chair out from under him and then insults his woman greatly. Like every, mm-hmm. every tool in his arsenal he can to d- humiliate this regal man before he destroys him is, is just like, wow. You never, we've never seen, never saw a Dracula like that before this. No, no. I mean, it, his official stance is that slavery has merit and he tries to make his case for that. And obviously Mammy Waldi's a, ma- a man of principle. <laughs> he actually kind of goes, just re- says, Sir, are you ill? Oh, like, that's my favorite line. I know. Isn't that great? I know. The whole time he's too. cool as a fucking cucumber and he's getting jabbed quite hard the whole time. He's getting provoked pretty heavily. Yeah, I mean, here, here's a guy who's, who's you know, he's he, who's probably seen it all if we're looking in the context of this character. Yeah. And yet he, he's like, what the? Like, are you ill? Like, he, even he can't believe the, the cheek of this guy. Like, it's like, <laughs> it's such a great... And, and again, William Marshall... Um, you got to throw all this on his shoulders because yeah. uh, he is just he's just magnetic in, in the elegance and the you know the regalness of this character. You, I could listen to him talk for hours. Uh, yeah, he could, he could like he could uh, you know read read the dictionary or you know whatever. <laughs> I mean, it'd just be like, I mean, he, yeah, it's great. I mean, my kids are I got three kids and you know every they I'm so, I've kind of ruined them because they're very young, but they their points of reference with culture are so steeped in the past that they have their peers are walk around perplexed every time they drop references <laughs> to stuff that their friends will have no idea what the hell they're talking about so not only did i like corrupt them with peewee's playhouse you know so they know every episode every line they know all the, that their friends have no idea what they're talking about but the king of cartoons is obviously william marshall so then you show them black yeah. on top of that so they're getting all this william marshall stuff and they're just wandering through life feeling so isolated now. I probably ruined them. <laughs> but, but even as the king of cartoons, when you'd watch that show, and even as a kid, when I really didn't put it together that that was Blackula, I was just like, this guy, man, this guy, just, as soon as he <laughs> walks in, he owns this show. He takes it over. All, everyone kind of bends to his energy as soon as he enters the room. And uh, then that's true for both Blackula movies. I'd like to sp- spend a little time talking about uh, Scream Blackula Scream towards the end of this. But, sure. uh, yeah. I-, I will say he's extremely sweaty all the time. <laughs> I don't know if it's a lighting issue or just they don't really care so much about making sure that he's he's not so sweaty, but he is glistening with sweat the whole time. <laughs> yeah, he is. I mean, they're cheap movies. I mean, you know, that's, I think, again, all these accidental things that we, we can... The uh... thing is, it's Marshall, right? So... Whatever indignity he sees suffering behind the scenes walking through this low-budget movie, he owns it so well. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. That, you know, we can't we, we can't laugh at this. We start to giggle at all the, the things wrong with it, the sweat, that, 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 but we stop because Blackula is sweating. It's not just like there's a mistake. It's like, why is Blackula <laughs> sweating? Wow. Yeah. Like what's, what fever has is, 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 is gotten him? Is it his bloodlust? Oh. What is it? Like we're so taken by this character that that becomes just part of the fabric of, of – uh, 
of this character that he has has created both by intent and accident. I think. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't nitpick in that way. Really, with those kind of things, I was happy. The second one, the second one is it feels a little bit cheaper to me. Yeah, and, uh, uh, he feels sweatier in that one, and I think that is for <laughs> sure the lighting. He's definitely, but then this, then again, the second one is this like sweaty voodoo thing. So yeah. maybe that that in and of itself makes sense too. So um, where we go next is I uh, would cut to the present day as was. Yeah, we cut to the present day, still in Dracula's castle. I'm guessing we assume then that Dracula has followed the timeline that we're familiar with, um, with regards to the Dracula story that we're familiar with, and he is now dead at the hands of Van Helsing, presumably. But now we are yeah. in today, or well, 1972's today. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we have, like you said, the two... Um, couldn't have been that many interracial gay couples in films at this time. I, I don't imagine there would have been. Yeah, you could say it's ahead of the curve in that way. Yeah, I don't, I, I'm thinking about it, and I can't, I can't imagine there would have been that many interracial gay couples. Um, I, any interracial i mean guess what year was guess who's coming to dinner i don't know i mean there weren't too many to begin with but i, I don't even know but why <laughs> I, it's funny you say that i didn't even when i'm thinking about that gay couple i didn't even my memory doesn't even snap to attention and say they're interracial i didn't even that didn't even yeah. factor into my because to me it's always every time i think of those those pair i think of uh the movie like marshall pushing and a lot of these black exploitation movies even though they were as especially once uh the whiteies got a hold of these movies okay. and were making them like printing them off like counterfeit money you know we know that they're exploitation films but under the guise that they're somehow uh you know legitimizing or or uh, giving the respect that was long denied to african americans in these movies so you know the movie bends over backwards to do that and yet has no problem throwing the gay couple to the to, to the wolves you know what i mean let's just make make they needed somebody to make another uh, non defended minority to make fun of so they threw these guys and after they're <laughs> dead the, the two gay guys are dead everyone just refers to them as a couple of they fashion drop, faggots or whatever yeah, you know they definitely <laughs> they drop more f bombs than n bombs that's for sure yeah yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, so it's it's I always found that funny. I didn't even think about the interracial element of it. That has another fascinating angle. But yeah, that was obviously there by intent. For yeah, sure. I actually just thought it was quite um quite a forward thinking thing to do. Um, or, I guess I guess it's avant garde until you actually hear them talk and it sounds like yeah, you know, yeah. Hey, let's go and raid Dracula's castle. <laughs> it's like, then it's like, oh, here we go back into the we're sliding back into the, you know, the darkness. Uh, yeah, as, I guess it's progressive until you have to engage with them in any way. Yeah, 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 I know, but we can. I mean, we can chalk that off. Sign of the time, sign of the of times. Course. Of course, you know, we can forgive all that stuff. It's not a big deal. And, and I remember writing about this movie at, at some point, and, and my friend Lee Gambin, the Australian uh, writer, who is uh, you know openly gay, but is also um, it's funny. I had a conversation with him publicly about this, and he's always been in favor of Hollywood actors staying in the closet if they so that they don't owe anybody mm -hmm. anything and that he finds uh, gay stereotypes in, in old movies absolutely hilarious and, and smashing and totally <laughs> you know doesn't doesn't get all worried about this being non-pc or anything else and he loves those two um as he calls them poofs yeah. you know he thinks they're yep. fantastic yeah. you know <laughs> so whatever we can look back at this and just shrug it off and it's not a not a huge deal and anyone who gets upset about that and writes blackula off because of its its backwards thinking stereotypes that are lurking in the peripheral has got a real problem i think yeah <laughs> so but they do serve the plot in one very important way they do yes and that, that's, um, that is true yeah they they uh they wedge open the coffin and let them out you've got the billy and bobby i think are their names okay I'm, oh god i'm gonna have to say the white one um okay. he cuts himself opening uh opening a crate and uh, at that point we get the really kind of classic slow coffin open yes um, so right. Bra blackula kind of reveals himself and it's an interesting entrance compared to how he's portrayed in the rest of the film mm -hmm. when he first emerges he's like practically feral yeah it's well like, yeah. He's, yeah. he's been locked up for yeah he's like pretty feverish 200 odd years yeah so. And obviously, like he fends off one of the de decorators, attacks the other. He's obviously got kind of serious physical strength because he doesn't react to a chair being broken on him and stuff like that. But I remember thinking <laughs> that, like, uh, he uh, so he attacks them and gets loose. And um, speaking as because Chris, full disclosure, I was watching this for the first time. Okay. But I was watching it for this. Um, so when I didn't know how it was going to shake out, how we, how he was going to appear as a character for the rest of the film, um, as an entrance or a re-entrance, if you like, compared to how he acts for the remainder, it was mm -hmm. kind of uh, it was kind of jarring. Well, yeah, I mean, when he goes feral, as you say, first of all, he has like the great growl. Yes. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, he when I love when he goes crazy and his blood lust and how they depict that by like his sideburns getting bushier and like he's just like, uh, 
Yeah, you know, he just looks he looks dirty and crazy, and his eyebrows get wild, and it's, yeah. he's like, oh, you know, he also he grows that. eyebrows on his cheeks. Yeah, I guess so. I, I guess they are a kind of furry little eyebrows thing. I always think just in my mind when I think of the movie, I just think of his sideburns going like full blown pork chop, like wild. Yeah, yeah. but uh, you're right; he does kind of have these like tufts on his cheeks. Yeah, kind of yeah, just that, on the, on very strange. Um, almost as if yeah, his eyebrows have kind of gravitated downwards, or his moustache has moved upwards. There's um, <laughs> it's a it's a, it's a great it's a great entrance anyway. I think it's, yeah, 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 so yeah. It, it is re- it is really uh, it's a great sequence for sure. I, I do like the uh, the makeup schemes in this for the vampires, not just Blackula, but um, oh yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, I mean, well, I guess we'll get to that a bit later because some of those key moments when we see those first uh, alabaster uh, African American <laughs> vampires and how they look and their ultimate effect. But anyways, well, no, you're actually, right. We've it's, actually it's... missed some of them by this point um, because we do get our first introduction to those kind of. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Colored, but they're white. Yeah. They're all white, but they are played by white actors at the beginning, so it's. That is it's true. A different, yeah, it's, it's a that different effect. And I think later on when we see them, it's to me. And again, the, it, sometimes I find it amusing when when people, including myself, overanalyze some of these movies, which probably the, these a lot of the, half of these things we're talking about weren't really on the, the filmmakers' minds at the time. But there is almost kind of like a reverse minstrel look to uh, to those black vampires when they show up later. It's almost <laughs> like they. I don't know. It's it's strange. Like they almost be when they become evil, they become white. It, I don't know if that's actually supposed to be there, but it adds a kind of an eerie element, both uh, kind of socially, but also visually as well. I find just very unsettling. Interesting. Yeah. Um. Uh, next in, uh, we've got the funeral of uh, one of the decorators, right? <laughs> yeah. One of the one of the funniest lines in the movie. And a, a friend of mine and I, we just, you know, not to. To drop the end bomb at all, but then there's that line that the the, the, care, the mortician has when he's trying to uh, you know bend over backwards to 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 appeal to you know to ingratiate himself into the doctor, and then when he leaves, that was the rudest end I've ever met. Right? Yes, <laughs> like one of the funniest lines that actor's face and the way William Crane just like goes right into it. You know, just, that's, that's a great funny 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 line. Yeah, that was great. Uh, and but yeah. um, crucially, it, it's like it to me. It reminds me of like it's like it was taken right out of Blazing Saddles or something. You know, it's like and yeah. thrown into this movie. So and it's around this time that we meet. Crucially, Doctor Gordon Thomas. Yeah, Gordon Thomas. Yeah, Thomas Rasulala. Yeah, yeah, that's a quite a name, huh? Wow. Yeah. yeah, yeah, veteran TV actor. Yeah, who adds, adds a lot of gravitas to the role. Again, I think the acting in Blackula is, is, you know, outside of you know Marshall, obviously, you know, here is a real actor. But I think even the guys in the peripheral are, are pretty good. Vanetta McGee's really good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I think even Gordon Pinsent, speaking of Canadians, he's one of ours. Uh, he's kind of at this point a kind of a legend in Canada, and I think this was his first American movie. Uh, you know, I think as the as the cop, I mean, I think he's good too. I think everyone pretty much toes the line. There's no outwardly bad performances. There's serviceable ones, and then there's good ones, and then there's William Marshall. You know, yeah. So I think our I think our doctor protagonist is a you know quality point of entry into the non-vampire side of the story yeah um, i agree I, and i think that yeah you're hitting on something as well i think that performance wise there's not really a weak link in the chain no i just there's you know there's just some that <clears throat> are thought, better than others i know? thought of one who uh his performance always jars me a little bit and that's uh, uh juanita the taxi driver oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, well, but... she goes full. She goes full blown. Yeah, like, she, you know, yeah, uh, she... mm-hmm, like she goes for it. You know. Um, yeah. We can we can get to her, but um, some of the stuff later on with her is some of my favorite stuff in there. Well, like, when she's yeah, when she's when uh, she's a vampire. When she's a vampire. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. yeah no, it's, sca- it's scary. I find that stuff scary. I, I actually I actually have that written down. There's um yeah, scene where she's like I'm advancing in slow motion down a corridor, and I genuinely think it's that. I've, the scariest moment in isolation in the whole film really reminds me it's one it's actually one of the scariest things i've ever seen i guess you know your perspective on the ride depends on when you get on the train as they say yeah and again all you know your favorite movies usually tend to be the ones you see at the right times and there was i remember seeing 
you know, I've said this before in interviews, but there was a Buffalo uh, out, of, out of America. There was a Buffalo channel that because it, Toronto, Canada is close to the border, we would get these channels and they'd have all night horror movies and Twilight Zone episodes. That's how I saw this stuff. But at four o'clock in the morning, they'd sign off and just throw a horror movie up with no commercials. And I'd wake up, I'd sleep with an alarm clock so I could sneak down and watch these movies. And I had to be really quiet because I didn't want to wake anyone up. And one of those movies was Blackula. And I'm talking like I was probably like 10. And uh, to see that sequence... It just as literally like it's we're leaking into about five in the morning and the sun is starting to come up, but I wasn't allowed to make any noises. I had to watch it very <laughs> quietly with my face right to the TV. And that sequence with her running down that hallway in slow motion oh, yeah. was this stuff of freaking nightmares. You know? And I still get frisions when I watch it. I still think it's scary. Yeah, I was gonna say, that'll, that'll mess a person up. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of demons. Um, yeah, yeah, the, the Lumberto Bava demons. Yeah, the Lumberto Bava yeah. demons, like when they're kind yeah, of no, advancing in slow motion. Yeah. Um, I think there's a bit Demons where, uh... two actually probably more than yeah. demons with yeah. the yeah 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 mm-hmm. yeah no I, and there was a lot of those uh, and then you saw that that trend a, a lot in um, in other AIP vampire movies like the Yorga movies had those slow mo yeah. running vampires and uh, and then you'd see them later on in like Salem's Lot as well I guess you know. What were they in what, were they slow mo in Salem's Lot I don't remember now am I just talking to my ass I don't remember. <laughs> That's been a while since I've yeah, watched Serums a lot, and that's for sure. And it's at this point that we meet uh, Dr. Gordon Thomas. And, and... Louva. Well, no. Well, hey, so his girlfriend, Michelle, and uh, Tina. And Tina, who we learn, or we come to realise, is, or we think is, the reincarnation, shall we say, of uh, well, well, they're both, well, well, they're, they're both, both Louva and Tina are both at least played by Fanana McGee, so I could yes. see how uh, Blackula would make that mistake. <laughs> 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 yeah, fair, fair. So yeah, he's kind of what he's kind of observing the scene from the shadows. So, so somewhere along the lines, Mamu Walde has picked up a cloak. He has, yeah, yeah. So he's, he's he's living it now. He's really living the vampire thing. Yeah, because he didn't. That's right. They don't explain where suddenly he ends up becoming a uh, caped, right? Because he's not when he comes out of the coffin. He's without cloak, correct? Yes. Yeah, he goes in. He certainly goes in without cloak. Is it Dracula's cape? Like, I mean, I haven't uh, analyzed the picture closely enough to see if that's the same cape not, that. It's not. I, okay. I don't remember. All right, interesting. I, I don't interesting. remember. No, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't possibly speculate on that, to be honest. Um, although I'm, I'm assuming that that's a question that's addressed in a deleted scene, because it's crucial. <laughs> um, I think it's yeah. in there, actually. I've got memory of him putting it on now. I've got memory of him putting it on after he kills the two decorator guys. Yeah, he might. I mean, it's... I don't know. I do. We'd have to watch. I mean, I've seen the movie 800,000 times. <laughs> and uh, it's funny. I, I, I don't... I didn't... I've never picked up on that at all. It, it's ever. So I have to watch it again and see. If anyone wants to head this off with just a little message telling us where he gets it, then that's fine. Yeah, that right. is. And ultimately, ultimately like like all these like minut- minutiae in, in Blackula, you know, it really doesn't matter. And it's actually kind of cool that if if that is the case and they don't address it, now, there's a bunch of things in the movie that uh, <clears throat> that that happen that that aren't really explained that I kind I kind of like that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. definitely. Um, I, don't need, I don't need everything spelled out. I don't need, I don't need the gynecology of every single detail in the movie spelled out to me now. So. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Um, so once he so he's once he spots and kind of makes the connection between Tina and Liva in his head, he's not the most subtle about it after that. Um, no, and no. so she understandably kind of freaks out when he appears, and um, what happens next is kind of like th- those two characters meeting, like, almost like a chase that she kind of understandably confuses with a mugging. Yeah, yeah. But- well, yeah. I mean, you're being you're being chased down the street by a you know like a six foot tall uh, guy in a freaking cape. I mean, you, you'd feel the same way <laughs> that maybe a mugging is a foot, or maybe not. Maybe you'd just be so like amused by the whole incident maybe you just let it happen i know i would if i was being menaced by some dude in a cape on, on the street i probably wouldn't run i'd be curious as to see how this uh, encounter would would pl- would play out but she runs nonetheless she runs for her life or you know she's she's on the move and he's a man in love so obviously he will stop at nothing and then as at this point he gets hit by the cab is that right or almost gets right after right after yeah. that she goes under an underpass and drops her handbag and he, he kind of right. picks it up and clutches it to his breast and then kind of tries to <laughs> kind of follows her into the road to try and see which direction she she goes in and then he's hilariously hit by a taxi yeah and it's at this point that as we mentioned just um before we kind of we meet Juanita and yeah she gets vampirized pretty quickly yeah. yeah, it's another one of my favorite scenes in the movie. It's it's one of those moments that uh, kind of drag you back to the uh, 
you know, the, the realization that this is indeed a black exploitation movie because they're hammering home the whole preconceptions of what you know, uh, you know, urban Americans would be like at that time. A little bit exaggerated, cartoonish, but that scene is is fascinating for one reason. A Blackula, Mama Walde, is not um, concerned about this woman at all. He's just pining over his love who's gotten away. Mm-hmm. And he kind of casually insults the, the cab driver. And um, she goes up one side of him and down the other. He doesn't seem to be – he's <laughs> nonplussed by the whole thing. He doesn't seem to be even paying it. She's just a minor annoyance in the peripheral until she, she says uh, – she calls him boy. Yeah, <laughs> and as soon as she does that, he slowly turns his head towards her, and like she knows that she stepped in it, she knows she's crossed the line, and that's the moment when he goes bananas, and the bloodlust kicks in, that's and it. a kind of primordial, you know, uh, anger kind of fuels him and takes over, and he becomes a uh, he becomes vampiric, you know. But it's interesting that that's that slur that uh, kind of wakes him up out of the stupor and awakes the beasts. Uh, so to speak. And again, it kind of calls to, um, you know, another element that's alive in a lot of these movies in that it's not just uh, black versus white. It's not just marginalized African-Americans, but it's also African-Americans uh, berating and, and, and humiliating each other. Yeah, you know, it's kind of an interesting element. She does. She doesn't just dive right into the slush. She takes her time to think about it before delivering it to him. So yeah, because uh, yeah, he's not reacting. Maximum impact. So she's got to pull. She's got to pull the sharpest tool in her arsenal out to stab him with, oh. and it's that word, yeah, right? There's, and, there's and, there's and, the... and it works, and she really screws herself because obviously we know what happens. And I think that you, you're kind of hitting on something there. I think that like w- the moments like that where kind of stereotypes are really amplif- amplified feel like a total backswing with a, by like a kind of backswing of the pendulum to the more kind of tender character stuff that come to a little bit later on yeah absolutely and that's the thing is blackula is a little bit disorienting in that in that way and that it, it kind of moves all around the place at its tone and yet it's anchored consistently by uh marshall's presence and his devotion to the character he never breaks out of that the movie may ebb and flow around him and there may be uh authentic portrayals of of, of mankind around him and then there's cartoonish <laughs> things happening as well and yet he never wavers and so i think that he's like the secret sauce of this this thing that kind of keeps it upright the whole time now you've said that um uh, a couple of weeks ago we had um heather buckley on she was talking about the ninth configuration oh yeah and yeah. um we were kind of talking about stacy keach's performance in that and kind of god like... heather i just gotta say heather i know i've known heather for years and she has been singing the praises of this movie <laughs> since forever since probably before the movie was made she must have anticipated that it would be made. <laughs> She loves that. I, I didn't know that she did an episode with you. She, I know yeah, how much she loves yeah. that thing. Sorry, I cut you off. No, that's fine. No, 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 no. Um, but yeah, she joined us a couple of weeks ago, and um, we were talking about how obviously that film's uh, tonal shifts are enormous and very abrupt. Yeah. And I think that the thing that kind of holds that together is how unwavering Stacy Keach is in that film. Is there a parallel to be drawn between kind of like the stabilizing influence of Stacy Keach in that to Mamu Waldi? To Mamu Waldi in this. <laughs> Well, yeah, and in in I guess in a weird way, I, mean, I don't think anyone in recorded history has ever uh, sat down and talked about the parallels between Blackula and the Ninth Configuration. <laughs> but Fair. I'm sure there 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 is in the sense that yeah, there is an ele- that movie is wild and it is all over, and that's why people love it. I think you know is that it's it's a movie that doesn't quite behave, and that's why it was you know always had a had a troubled fate upon its release. Yeah. <clears throat> but you know maybe maybe I mean there's a lot of movies out there like that 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 I I think some of my favorite movies are kind of like that that are, are kind of manic and shifting in tone, yet they have some sort of magnetic element that draws you in and keeps you there consistently. Yeah. And also sells, that's believable, you know, especially when you're toiling in the genre and fantastic cinema. Um, you need some sort of anchor or entry point that you can relate to that is somewhat behaves as accordance to the natural laws of the universe that uh, that kind of keeps you in that world. You yeah, know? it's and, like a great yeah. thing. Pretty quickly after this, Mamu Waldi pursues Tina to the this nightclub, uh, nameless nightclub. I don't think it's ever <laughs> named. Um, yeah, I would love to know what it was called. But uh, yeah, he b- basically goes to the Tom the the handbag to Tina in the nightclub, which has uh, the Hughes Corporation who sang "Rock the Boat." Um, not yeah. singing, not singing "Rock the Boat." Sadly, but singing an, another. Well, not sadly, singing another equally. No, I should, uh, look the other way when it comes for you yeah it's a great <laughs> yeah. uh, wild and it's just it's it's so great about that scene is that you know uh, gene page did the music for this thing and it's it's if you're a fan of blackula you're a fan of the the music even if you're not a fan of blackula the soundtrack record 
in and of itself has a following. It's a great score. Yeah. Um, but the mu- the movie and, and a lot of black exploitation cinema is very much informed by by the sound, obviously the soundtracks, the music. And uh, what I love about that sequence is that the movie just stops dead to accommodate that musical performance. It's not a musical, and yet the movie just stops, and all the characters stop, and everyone's just watching these guys perform. And uh, so are we, like you know. And it's I mean it's a very energetic, wild, spastic performance that you're watching, and uh, and the song is great. You know, mm-hmm. and it's it's just cool how the movie just kind of does that. It's like it, everything just goes out for a smoke while this, <laughs> this uh, musical number just shows up. You totally. Know? And, it, and it's in a scene where I think like, um, you know, you're seeing a lot of kind of really important early interactions between some of the main characters and things. And um, it's interesting to me that the film can stop and kind of just really drink in and enjoy that moment without being yeah. a momentum breaker to any of the narrative stuff that goes on in that scene. No, it just adds another element of groove to it, you know, and it keeps and drags us into this environment. And then obviously introducing the uh, visually, um, you know, bizarre uh, image of, of Mama Malde himself prancing around in this nightclub. You know, it's just uh, a <laughs> it's it's a, it is a it's I mean, ultimately, Blackula is a fish out of water story. Yeah. Oh, yeah most, uh, most no more relevant yeah, he, is it than yeah. when he prances into this nightclub. I mean, it's just like, wow, who's this freaking guy pimping it? And that's, I mean, goes back to what the movie originally was intended to be. It was kind of like a one joke premise yeah. that uh, basically a black Dracula is running around the streets and uh, hanging out with pimps and hustlers in nightclubs and doing whatever he's going to do. So that's pretty much, I guess, the, part of the original design of, of the picture it would have been nonstop moments like that, you know. It's pretty remarkable that the film that we get is where it ended up when that was what was driving it in the first place. Yeah, yeah no, I mm-hmm. yeah, agree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mamu Waldi can drink as well. He orders French champagne, despite it all being French. <laughs> yeah. He drinks the champagne. Later on in the film, he orders a Bloody Mary as well. Now, Solid that's joke. interesting. That's interesting, stepping outside the, the kind of preconceived well, notions so we, of Well, we know from, like, this, from, from Stoker's book and from you know, the first... I never drink wine, right? I mean, yeah. uh, traditionally, Dracula sets a nice table, but he never touches. Um, so, but I mean, you've seen vampires throughout history that will, you know, in order to fool their human prey, uh, you know, to walk with the natives, they'll, they'll partake in some sort of drink or something. They do that, they uh, do that weird yeah. thing where you, you open, you, you kind of turn to the side, you open your mouth, and you just chuck the drink over your shoulder. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see, that would have ruined it if we saw him doing that. You know, he, oh, yeah, may have, well, he may have done that, but we don't want to see that, you know. Yeah, that would, that uh, and would it's, take it, it's it interesting. Well. It's interesting too because it's a it's a joke now by by today's uh, horror movie standards that uh, a vampire would walk into a bar and order a Bloody Mary. It sounds like a like a two priests and a you know walk into a. You know, it sounds like one of those gags. But this may have been the first time that we'd we'd seen that. You know, Quite this possibly. may have been ground ground zero for that joke. Yeah, maybe, maybe. You know, like, yeah, I, th- I think it would be harsh to say that it felt played out in a film that came out in 1972 because you just don't know. No, no, yeah, yeah. yeah I, don't think we, I mean, the, it may have been an existing gag joke somewhere. I, for some reason, I can see like a Forey Ackerman or something in the pages of oh, Famous yeah. Monsters, using it using it as a throwaway line. But I don't think we'd seen it in a film before. No. I don't want to get past the scene without talking about one of my favourite ancillary characters who appears very briefly, twice. In talking about, when speaking of hustlers? Yeah. Yeah, Skillet. Skillet. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I'm a fan of Skillet. For, for, <laughs> well, for, for, he's... for his short screen time, I'm a fan. He's like our cab driver, you know, he kind yeah. of just uh, you know, drags his screaming onto the streets with this broad caricature. Uh, but it's incredibly entertaining. And again, funny. I mean, Black Hill is a very, uh, part of the reason I love it is it is a very funny movie. The filmmakers are in on the joke. And yet again, we're not laughing at Black Hill. We're not laughing at the horror of the movie. We're laughing at these characters reacting to him. Yeah. So Skillet's uh, reaction to Black Hill is, is one of the, the funniest and most memorable you know, aspects of the movie, I think. Yeah, and you're talking, and you're kind of hitting on something pretty important there, I think, in the sense that Blackula is funny when it is playing itself for laughs. It's it's yeah. not it's, it's not incidentally funny, and it's not funny in a way that ridicules him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's, I th- I think that a lot of kind of horror comedies, as it were, kind of fall down in that way. I think that if you laugh at the wrong things, or if you play the wrong things for laughs, or if you get the balance of those two tones or those wrong then I think that you can take the viewer out of it in a way that a film can't recover from. And yeah, you, you, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You can't, you can't take the piss out of your, out of your villain. You can't, you can't do that. And if you do that once, it's very hard to correct yourself and make, make that uh, element a threat again. 
And, uh, you know, I think of the best horror comedies like an American werewolf in London, a very funny movie or return of the living dead, very funny. But when the horror hits, it hits and it stays that way. The, the threat is real. Uh, mm. we're laughing at the characters reactions to the threat, mm. but we're never laughing at the threat. And that's, you know, that, that scene again with the cab driver, you know, it's, um, it's funny as hell when she's ripping him apart, but that one moment, it just turns on a dime, turns on a word mm. when, uh, when the horror hits again and it's not funny anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, skill, skillet never gets a chance to really get uh, <laughs> to go down down the road. He's always there as kind of the comic relief. That's that's pretty much his function. Yeah, he's more of a he's kind of a like a passing observer. That's kind of humorous. He's kind of like the yeah, just, for the he, audience. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Blackula's funny when it needs to be. It's heartwarming when it needs to be. Like the stuff between Dracula and Tina. Uh, sorry, Dracula. Fuck. Uh, Blackula and Tina. Like when they're alone and they're kind of they're having their kind of quiet moments together about. Um, the life that they could have, should have, want to have. I think all that stuff's done really well. And then you've got these real moments. Uh, the some of the horror stuff really hits, like uh, the it's scene with the, yeah, yeah, the scene with the the photographer. There's a like um, the photographer takes a photo of Blackula in the nightclub. This is straight after this. Straight after this, yeah, and um, kind of there's a, a jump scare there when um, just after she realizes that Blackula doesn't appear in any of the photographs. Oh, in the dark room. Yeah. That's a good, that's a that's a great jump scare. Uh, yeah, we've seen we've seen this this shot in a, again. I'm I'm trying to recollect. We've seen this shot in a million uh, vampire movies. You know, and, and like stuff like Fright Night when we we don't see Jerry Dandridge in the mirror. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's been done to death. I don't know if it had been done to death necessarily in '72, but even if it had been, it's a scene that works. You know, sometimes mm-hmm. cliches are a cliche for the reason. Yes, for a reason. You yes. know. It's an it's almost like an essential element in any vampire movie when they're trying to pass themselves off as human that they're going to get caught. And it's usually done by mirror or photograph. I mean, that's just the way it is. And it's handled, like you say, beautifully and uh, incredibly tense and stylish, too. It's a very stylish movie for its all its cheapness. It's incredibly, uh, mm-hmm. I think, anyways. Yeah, I, um, I agree. Very, very well shot. You yeah. know, very well shot. Another bit that really works for me in the, the kind of horror stakes so to use the word stakes that oh, wasn't that wasn't, uh, that wasn't hey. Um, hey. but uh, as the bit in the morgue where um, Juanita's corpse obviously she's done the running down the corridor thing and then they pull a crucifix on her yeah. and she screams and screams and it's yeah. pretty horrific <laughs> Yeah, I, I, again I don't um, to portray the vampire especially in its in its birth as this uh, like a screaming animal I think that's yeah. uh, very innovative and, and, and terrifying and uh, again, I remember seeing this movie as a, as a kid sitting there in front of that television at like whatever it was, four or five in the morning, not trying, to, trying not to wake anybody up and getting subjected to those screaming feral <laughs> vampires alone was uh, blood chilling. And even today, you know, as a jaded, as jaded a viewer as I am, I still find, uh, you know, her running down that that hallway in slow motion with her claws extended. That's a frightening, nightmarish visage. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. On the subject, actually, of kind of more horror sequences that I think are really well done, this kind of moves us forward because uh, Dr. Thomas wants to do an autopsy on the decorator who's died. Oh, yeah. Um, he can't get permission to exhume and carry it out, and uh, in classic Maverick style, decides to do it anyway, uh, which I like. Um, yeah. But when he does, um, the body wakes up immediately. The vampire, as it were, wakes up immediately, and he has to dispatch it brutally and instantly, and I think that that's really well done in the same way. Yeah, he's. I like his character. I mean, he's. I, I guess he's a uh, many elements rolled into one. He's like Van Helsing by way of Shaft. <laughs> so he, he even kind of looks like Richard Roundtree a little bit from from <laughs> Shaft. And he's just no nonsense, fuck protocol, gets the job done, and uh, no fuss, no muss, no no beating around the bush, no time to react in horror. Just get, oh, yeah. get it, very get her done. You know, this is it. We got it. This is what we're a man on. We're a I'm a man on a mission, <laughs> and I like the immediacy and urgency of that sequence, and the whole way that that our heroes even confront the vampires or even wrap their head around the fact that this is a legitimate threat. <laughs> um, it, it happens very, very quickly, but yet very believably and organically. Yeah. The, there's a great scene with him and Blackula in the nightclub where they're kind of having this kind of verbal spar off. Mamu Walde knows that uh, that the doctor's coming for him. The doctor knows Mammy Waldy's a vampire, um, but they have this kind of back and forth. Mm, could you, do you think it could? Be yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very balletic <laughs> sequence, and, and you know it kind of reminds me of um, it, like something like uh, Michael Mann's Heat. You know where? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, remember you know like Pacino and De Niro. You never actually see them in any scenes together, really. But they're the antagonists of each other: good versus evil, good cop and 
thief. And yeah. then there's that moment where they kind of sit down. I don't know if they're having a drink or a coffee. I can't recall. But they, uh, it's a very mannered, polite conversation that they're having. And yet they're basically telling each other, not in so many words, that uh, I'm going to kill you. And there's nothing you can do about it. And the other guy's like basically like, well, you're going to do your best and we'll see what happens. And that's what's happening between these two characters. Yeah. They're very politely and articulately and intelligently drawing the line in the sand between each other and saying, this is it. I'm going to kill you and we'll see what you can do. Yeah. And I, I love that. I love the elegance of it. You know, it's uh, yeah. very, very articulate. And I don't know, if, again, if that's Marshall's influence, be him being mm -hmm. a Shakespearean actor and he inserting this kind of uh, level of sophistication into this movie that wasn't really there before. But uh, I love that this is an, a thinking person's vampire movie when it needs to be. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. I love the the, uh, the kind of question of whether Mama Mama Wilde is a vampire. By this point, is completely answered by the fact that he is sitting there <clears throat> dressed like a vampire. Yeah, the, the cloak, the <laughs> yeah, collar, yeah, the collars not... up. Like... Yeah, I, I I I love that the fact that you know they don't try to. You know, I remember as a kid watching uh, staying up late again like i did man i don't know how i ever slept i'm surprised i'm not three feet tall i don't know but uh you know stunt your growth but i, I would stay up all night watching movies i remember the first time i saw uh carl freund's the mummy 1932's the mummy and how freaking bummed out i was that he's only karloff is only the mummy in the bandages for the first like 10 minutes yeah. And then he shambles off and he appears later as Imhotep, all dressed in lovely garb. And I'm like, what the hell is this all about? He's the freaking mummy. You should be the mummy all the time. <laughs> yeah. And so I love the fact that, you know, Blackula doesn't try to, like, fit in with polite society and adopt the, the clothes of the period. He shamelessly walks around in the in the in the cape and the, the clothes that he was buried in. You know, <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I love the fact that no one really addresses that. You know, it's great. Apart from the one moment where I think Skillet mentions the cape, except for Skillet and his badass cape comment, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, yeah he wants to be. He wants to beat him out of that cape. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So the other, I guess that as as the kind of film moves on and you have kind of uh, Thomas and everyone else putting together uh, the kind of vampire strand, the other thing that's going on is the developing uh, love story between Mamualde and Tina, which I think. In the few scenes where it's handled, I mean, don't get me wrong, once he explains his origins to her, she is sold on that pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the actual the actual character stuff that goes on between them and the scenes that they have to themselves is um, is really well done. It's one of the stronger things in here. Yeah, I agree. It's um, Again, it's the anchor of the movie. Is it's, it's a romance. It's a tragic, doomed romance. Um, again, like the best of Shakespeare, it has this kind of sense of gravitas and, and, and doom. You know, and there's elements of, you know, we mentioned so many things in this movie that kind of uh, are trailblazing when it comes to vampire cinema and the betrayals of vampirism. Uh, and I would say that the romantic element is uh, original, but but not really, because, you know, I kind of forgot about Dark Shadows, which uh, oh, yeah. beat this to the punch by a few years. And then the movie was released in 71. The show had been running since, what, 69 or something. So, I mean, that was a big part of it was Barnabas Collins was didn't want to be a vampire. He was taken against his will, kind of cursed and thrown into a coffin. And he uh, really just wanted uh, he, he wanted to love his the reincarnation of his, his girlfriend. It was a jo Josette. Was that her name? Or fiance? Anyway, so that's kind of the spine of, of Blackula. Yet these two actors, Vanette McGee and William Marshall, really sell it. And what I love about it, too, is that traditionally the vampire is, is thought of academically as a rapist because he just takes what he wants. <laughs> yeah. But here 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 Blackula, you know, he, he basically says, here's here's what's going on. I love you. And. You know, this is what will happen to you if you join me, and I'm not going to force you. So it's kind of like up to you. And I love the fact that, that Marshall and, and uh, Crane gave the grace to the character where he doesn't just steal and take what, what yeah. he wants. He, he offers it. You know, I think that's really a, really a nice touch. So moving on. We're kind of coming, coming down to the, the, the end here. You've got a really big, massive action set pieces, kind of two back to back, where um, the kind of police turn up at Mamu Waldi's hideout, I suppose, and they have this big kind of running battle with all the interestingly coloured uh, vampires. And I just for just before we jump in, so this is like this is kind of Tina's kind of made the call to almost go with him at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. she's 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 on board. Yeah, but yeah, you've got the standoff as you were saying. Yeah, you got the standoff between the, the vampires and um, there's a real kind of uh, George Romero way in his kind of Dawn of the Deadiness to the to the color in the vampires, I think. Yeah, yeah, and years years before Dawn of the Dead. I mean, that's what I was saying at the beginning too, is that there's almost kind of a, a reverse minstrel thing when you're putting white face on black people, which again could be thought of as some sort of um, comment. You know, 
comment. You, I really probably don't think it was, but it kind of mm-hmm. you could read that in there, and it, it does work in, in an odd way into the fabric of the movie that has that kind of bizarre visual. But yeah, you're right. In Dawn of the Dead, I was thinking of that feral in the tenement sequence with the SWAT team at the beginning, yeah, yeah. That mm-hmm. feral uh, zombies with the Tom Sabini's like gray white makeup bursting out of the closets. And uh, sometimes in my mind, I get those confused with the uh, the vampires in Black Hill, but but okay. uh, obviously. Crane, Marshall, and the gang beat them to the beat Romero to the punch by many years. But yeah, there is a. I, th- I think it's just there's a feeling about these kind of lower budgeted horror movies of that period, and, and Blackula has that that same feeling about it. I can't really ar- even articulate it. I'm sure you even know what I mean. Outside of the vampire makeup, it's you know there's a feeling about these kind of yeah. lower budgeted '70s horror films. I I, I don't know but, really what it is. Yeah, driven bad. by music, driven by kind of a starkness. I I don't know melancholy. I can't even describe it. But there's some great stuff in this scene. There's some amazing full body buns. You've got like they're throwing these kind of homemade Molotov cocktails. Oh, it's it's like a, t- a technically impressive scene in loads of ways. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we go pretty much uh, to. And there's what... a lot of horns. We might add this gives uh, Gene Page a chance to really blow out the horn section <laughs> and his score. Fuck like, yeah. Like blah, 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 <laughs> really go for it as the action kicks in. So that's like the highlight of of many things. The culmination of the a- physical action, but it's also where Page just gets to go ape shit with. The sound yeah. <laughs> and then we move to what i think might be the set um for the denouement of this film might also take place in the same place where the end of the incredible melton man takes place now um, do you know this for a fact or we're just they were just thinking i don't know for a fact but in my head i'm going well they were produced by the same com- the same company produced them um, it totally it it's looks all, very it much is, the similar it, it has that you're right either that or there's just a lot of those kind of joe blow factories around i mean i don't know but you're right in my mind i see the uh poor alex rebar melting into yeah. was it alex rebar who yeah, played the melting? Yeah. 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 melting into goop at the end uh and then black strolls by again all these kind of like <laughs> you see so many of these movies at the same time when you close your eyes they all just kind of mash into one big weird movie <laughs> um and as this kind of pulls itself to the end um in the struggle and kind of in the in the kind of chaos at the end, uh, Tina is inadvertently shot by a police officer, yeah. and the aftermath of this is framed very dramatically and very cinematically. But yeah. um, the the incident of her actually getting shot is present, presented really coldly, which I think is interesting. It's like it's almost yeah. it feels incidental until he's kind of over her body. Yeah, no, it, it's a uh, you're right, and it's um it's not a big emotional moment at that time. It's just something that just kind of happens not an anti-climax that's not the right way right thing to say about it but it doesn't seem to have most movies would really make a point of making that sequence incredibly dramatic yeah i'm not uh, entirely sure what it does or doesn't bring to the table i just think it's an interesting choice no it's an interesting choice but then it's again as you say it's it's the effect of that and how it plays out and also starts to unite these two opposing forces um, because i guess really in a way it's kind of a love triangle to the film right so uh it kind of like when I was a kid, I remember there was a series of Marvel put out called the the What If series. They'd have one one comic. I remember it was like, What If Hulk went on a rampage and Hulk just goes around killing everybody. Another one is like, What If uh, is it the Invisible Girl dies? So, you know, the Invisible Girl and the Fantastic Four uh, dies for whatever reason, and it just shows the, uh, the catastrophic. Uh, effect of, on that on all the people in the fantastic four's orbit including dr doom who obviously his mission was to destroy the fantastic yeah. four but he really loved uh, the invisible girl so he kind of lays down arms and is incredibly devastated and it unites reed richards and, and dr doom even for that one moment where they're kind of reacting to the same thing and they're kind of on the same page and that's kind of where this at post shooting leads blackula to its uh, climax this is kind of very just kind of sad petering out of an ending you know? yeah, I mean, that's uh, it, he's, at this point he realizes that he's got nothing to be here for. Uh, before before we start, kind of before we kind of break this down, actually, I think that the actual chain of events around this is really interesting because basically, so she gets shot and she's about to die as a human. Yeah. And so he bites her to turn her into a vampire to effectively save her. Mm-hmm. And then, mm-hmm. kind of in the ensuing melee. Yeah, melee. I feel like yeah. She gets inadvertently staked through the heart by a police officer who assumes that it's going to be uh, Black Hill who's in the government. Right. Um, so what you have there, and then the, so obviously he's now effectively lost her twice, and yeah, I think that there's an unbelievable sadness, not just to the way that the plot beats unfold, uh, but in his performance, I think that he brings a lot to it. Well, he just kind of, he again, it, it, it it's true to the character from the very first frames of the movie. You know, Dracula fucks him by stealing his, by first berating, you know, insulting his woman and stealing her, and then 
uh, you know, doing what he does. And then he spends the entire rest of the film, for better or for worse, wanting nothing more than just to be with her. And uh, when he, he loses her, you know, not for just a second time, like a, yeah, like a third time, really, but then there's no, there's nothing else for him. There's no purpose for the character. There's no purpose mm-hmm. for him. And he's ready to, to die. And I, I just, I love that sequence. Um, and again, you've seen it in many other films where the vampire just kind of yeah. says, fuck it, and walks off into the sun and deteriorates. But it's this is kind of ground zero for it. And it's incredibly effective. It is. It's great when um he kind of after that's happened and it looks like you know they're raising their guns on him or whatever and he kind of just he's, he's just kind of like I'm not a threat yeah, to you anymore. You know, gentlemen, yeah, just gentlemen. There's no need. It's like yeah, <laughs> it's like don't need. Lay down your arms. You know, I'm kind of I'm done here. I'm cashing my chips and walking off into the sunset and uh, literally walking like a cowboy walking off into the sunset yeah. except he doesn't get very far. <laughs> but. Uh, no, oh, it's beautiful. So it's a the it's a drag. Black has so many things, and ultimately, at its heart, black beating heart, it's a it's a it's a tragedy. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Like, like yeah, it's like it's like some proper Shakespearean notes getting hit at the end. I think. And oh, again, again, so we I don't know. We don't know how much of that is is Marshall's influence because obviously he commanded a great deal of control over the production enough to change the entire to change the name of the character, the very idea of the character, and. Uh, I wonder how much of that he brought to it, the, the gravitas uh, of it, the, the literacy of it. I'm, I'm sure a great deal. And um, as we're kind of pulling towards the end of this thing, I mean, I, I think like, for one thing, some of the things you've said over the course of the conversation, Chris, it kind of makes me want to go and read a little more and have more of an understanding of what actually happened behind the scenes with this film and how it's, how it, like, its kind of journey from its original conception to the film that we ended up getting. I'd like. I'd love to read the original script. Original script. Yeah, I'd be very interested in that. Well, there's, you know, the, the, in my in my travels, uh, doing a little research, on, you know, I've seen this movie so many times, but looking a little deeper in the, for the purposes of this conversation, I did find out that William Crane is still alive, and uh, wow. I did track him down, and I did reach out to him, and in in order to hopefully secure an interview for for one of my my outlets. Uh, so obviously there's a million questions we want to ask about Blackula <laughs> and I know there's so many I want to ask and hopefully he gives me the green light and we can uh, get the right from the horse's mouth. You know? Incredible. Because there's not many there's not many people around really left from the movie that would be able to answer with any certainly Marshall's long gone. That would mm-hmm. be able to answer with any authority. So it's great that the director, the man who actually steered the boat, is. So hopefully he's game to uh, chat a little bit. And if you uh, do want more Blackula for your buck um, and you wish I'd love to know a little bit more about him I'd love to see more adventures then you're in luck because there is a sequel Scream Blackula Scream um, <laughs> yeah. quite a different beast in many ways but one that I've still got a massive amount of affection for well it's it's weird it's I mean it's it's such a strange movie and it bears the mark of I see I think it's an inferior movie I don't like it any less I like it differently than Blackula yeah you, you know what I mean I think I think Blackula is authentic. It feels like an authentic, you know, and it really, I think it does bear saying that it is directed by a, a, a black filmmaker. So there is that sensibility that it feels authentic. Mm-hmm. Whereas uh, Scream Blackula, Scream feels like a sequel. It feels like a movie that's adding more, throwing more at the screen uh, than needs to be there, more exploitative elements. Mm-hmm. And it is directed by Bob Kelgen, who did the uh, Count Yorga movies, which yeah. share the kind of American International Pictures DNA with this uh, series. And so it just it feels like an, an, a Count Yorga movie where Robert Corey has been erased and William Marshall has been <laughs> kind of inserted into it, which is not really a criticism because it's a great, weird vampire movie with a voodoo cult. And of course, Pam Greer. Uh, uh, Pam Greer and her uh, comely prime. Yeah, I mean, geez, yeah. she's just a, a thing of beauty. My God, masterwork <laughs> of humanity. Uh, <laughs> she's fantastic in this movie, and she's a great actress too. So I mean, it's yeah, just yeah. bouncing her and Marshall against each other adds a, a different kind of romantic angle than the other one had. A less yeah. a traditional Shakespearean uh, kind of tragic romance. And something a little scrappier and edgier, I yeah. think, in Scream Blackula Scream. Uh, Mamu Waldi's got more of an angle in this one. He's got more of an agenda um, in Scream Blackula Scream. And uh, Pam Greer's more his vessel to kind of complete his agenda, if you like. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you know, this is, we talked about this off camera and that, uh, you know, he's trying to um, he exploit her mad voodoo skills in order to cure his vampirism. You know, yeah. He wants to be cured. And that, again, harkens back to Dark Shadows. Because there's that L, that subplot where Barnabas is trying to do the same thing scientifically via the the doctor is trying to cure him uh, of his vampirism so he can 
live a normal, quote unquote, normal life. That's the, but that's a weird angle in and of itself. And I also find Dra- Blackula really mean in the second one. Like he's really nasty. Yeah. I don't think he's nasty in the first one. This one he seems like just like he's kind of a nasty dude. I think he's there's a bit- also that. But there is one great moment in the sequel that I think maybe a little too ham fisted. Right. In the sense that it's hammering home the whole what black exploit. See, so black exploitation movies were authentic when they began, and they really did have something to save. And then when the uh, when Whitey got a hold of them, I feel <laughs> anyways, they just they were exploitation films under uh, a socially important sheen, a, a costume. It was an artifice, which is fine too. But there's that moment in Scream Blackula Scream, which I think is is a great sequence because Marshall is amazing in it, but it almost pushes that. A meaning a little bit too ham fistedly. It's that moment when the two pimps meet uh, Blackula on the oh, street. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. and uh, he, tur- he turns to them and they like shitting all over him. They're ripping him apart, making fun of his cape. And he gives them this whole lecture about how he enslaves uh, his black sister and, and how like he, he just goes to town. It becomes like a PSA, a public service announcement or something. It's wild. Yeah. It's a little too much because it kind of spells it all out, but it's still a really great moment to, that gives the character Blackula a chance to really. Uh, articulate his uh, you know his feelings I, I don't know it's, I think it's my favorite part of the movie <laughs> well if you're in the UK you can pick up there's a double blu-ray edition out from Eureka That's what you've yeah and if you're if you're not in the UK and you're you're in uh, my continent over here uh, Screen Factory also put out uh, presumably struck from the same elements uh, mm. double feature as well of the two films yeah there oh cool go. okay so yeah. Mitch, how did you come down on Black Hill then? Um, I liked it. I liked it a lot. I would say coming from uh, having kind of a surface knowledge of the subgenre and a surface knowledge of the film, I want to see more of this now. I also I want to see Scream Black as well. <laughs> but yeah, no, uh, but yeah, no, I thought it was great. I thought that, um, and we kind of touched on this earlier. I think that it's trying to do a lot of different things, and that could be for all uh, like all sorts of reasons. But I think that there's a lot of kind of pretty wild, pretty divergent stuff that coexists pretty peacefully in here um i think it's really well made performance wise again it runs a spectrum performance wise but everyone is really good yeah um yeah there's loads of things about this and just um, like always chris i appreciate you bringing it to the table because a lot of these are first watches for me i am not as knowledgeable as andy is or most of the guests so i'm always kind of thankful to get the opportunity to catch up on these things well no no problem and i mean again with me with black hill i mean i, I love black exploitation movies a lot i mean and they're always fun they're always a uh... Especially if you throw Pam Greer into the mix, and especially if, Sid Higgs, especially if Jack Hill directed it, and, oh, and Sid yeah. Higgs also hanging out there too, then we're having a lot of fun. It's a party. But uh, you know, there's that handful of ones in in, in the early part of the decade, post uh, Sweet Sweet Back, like Shaft, mm-hmm. and um, and Black Caesar. Black Caesar. Yeah. But I think Black Hill is one of them. So I think it's it's an, not only just a very entertaining, interesting movie. Uh, with a great performance in, in its core and also other the peripheral performances are also more than acceptable yeah super uh, strong. and with some great with some great it's a great dracula it's a great vampire story some good good laughs lots of horror in it but i also think it's an important movie and as far as if uh, understanding uh not just the genre but also america at that period you know i think it's it's just a it's, it's an impo- socially important movie whether it wanted to be or didn't I think it is. Yeah, and uh, Andy, this was a revisit for you. Oh yeah, multiple revisit for me. Um, Blackula is one of my one of my favorite vampire films. Okay. Ever made? It st- stands up there with things like uh, Near Dark for me, which. Uh, l- oh, l- Near Dark is uh, yeah, my God, is it towering masterpiece yeah. even going back to salem's lot as well i would have salem's lot in there again it's very elisha cook jr is in salem's lot as well as yeah. the guy who plays the uh, the corner <laughs> he's but so good it, it, he's so good and it but the the dna is again it's something about those 70s even though salem lot was not a low budget it was a but it was a television film yeah, so right. it still has the same kind of feel that a lot of those uh, 70s movies had and, and <clears throat> as far as vampires are portrayed on screen they're also animalistic and, and horrifying in that in toby hooper's movie so that's one of my favorites too hmm. love it love it it's brilliant and i'll watch it a million million more times <laughs> <laughs> yeah um chris we're uh, i guess we're kind of coming to the end here but before we do um anything in particular of your own that you'd like to take a second to mention well yeah i mean i just uh, when i quit uh, doing the fangoria thing I, I was in the cusp of transitioning to a magazine i run called delirium okay uh with my, my partner charles band the producer oh yeah and you can go to 
deliriummagazine.com and you can subscribe to our magazine or you can buy individual copies. We just finished our 17th issue. Nice. Um, and then outside of that, I do pursue a, um, a vigorous sideline making <laughs> my own feature films and also uh, composing and, and scoring films and, and, and really, uh, most excitingly to me, uh, releasing my own albums of my own material. So if you go to chrisalexanderonline.com, you can um, you can see my, my stuff, listen to tracks, and, and hopefully pick up a couple uh, couple discs. Okay, and um, social media, do you want to do any of those? <laughs> yeah, I'm on I'm on uh, Farce Book. Yes, you can find me there, and I'm on uh, Twatter. <laughs> Although I don't twat very often, but I'm definitely on there. An infrequent fire. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> Read into that what you will. <laughs> Uh, Chris, thanks so much for taking the time tonight. We appreciate it. All right. Thanks, guys. Take care. Stay Bye. Easy. Thanks, man. So one thing that I've really enjoyed on the show over the last few weeks is the range of stuff that we've gone through, starting from, say, a couple of weeks ago when Heather was on with the ninth configuration, which I would say, I was going to say arguably, not arguably at all, the most cerebral film that we've done so far. I disagree. Oh, really? Yeah. Go on. Rawhead Rex. <laughs> no, okay. no yeah, you, you are, of course, correct. Yeah, yeah. And then I um, think that um, after that, obviously, we had Memoirs of an Invisible Man, which was obviously way lighter. Mm-hmm. And like, I don't, like, I don't, I don't like calling it a palate cleanser, but you know what I mean. It was like kind of uh, it was a much lighter turnout of something mm-hmm. as dark and as heavy as the ninth. And then tonight, something totally different again. And I think that something that maybe strikes a little bit of a balance of both. Yeah. And a big thank you to Chris for massive, massive thanks to Chris for coming on and doing that. I loved it. Uh, like I said, it's a film that. I've got an amazing amount of affection for. Uh, it fills me with so much joy to watch it. Um, and it was a while since I'd revisited it. In fact, uh, I actually ran out and got the Eureka Blu-ray for this very purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd be and, curious to know if anybody else out there has done that. Yeah, well, you should, because it's not. there's not a lot going on in the in the kind of... Extras. In terms of extras and all that. I think there's um, Kim Newman's on there talking about the Blackula, the kind of impact of Blackula, stuff like that. Okay. For the two films alone, absolutely worth it. I think I picked it up for like six quid on Amazon. And that's on Blu-ray. Both films in the one package. Can't say fair than that. Yeah, hunt it down. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely worth your time and your money. And talking about weird things that we've watched and um, how the kind of tone of the films that we've been watching have been moving and changing. There's been a bit of everything. I'm looking ahead to the next few weeks, mm-hmm. and the guests that we have lined up for the next few weeks also fall into that bracket. We've got some um, interesting films coming up. Yeah, and some really good guests as well. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, the combinations are going to be really interesting. I am uh, really looking forward to getting in amongst some of the stuff that we've got up and coming. And on the subject of that, we'll be back 8 a.m. on Monday. Why? Minnesota 12. Mini Sods. Mini Sod 12. For we will be an- slightly less mini these days. Um, but yeah, we'll be back 8 a.m. Monday with Mini Sod 12, where we will answer such burning questions as What has Mitch been watching from the Shockwaves 100? Fuck all. Currently, fuck all. <laughs> I need to step my game up on that one and get something watched. Has Andy watched anything? Has he? I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, but crucially, who is our guest for next week and what is their film? Which sounded a little bit too much like, who is your daddy and what does he do? Yeah, and it also sounded like you were just going to tell us. Yeah, I am not going to do that. So I was like on the edge of my seat like, oh, this is, he's gone way off book. He's lost his fucking mind again. I have not gone off book. We will (laughs) announce that on, uh, we'll announce that on Monday, of course, as well as all the usual stuff. We'll uh, be taking a look at your feedback, what we've been watching this week. Maybe give a shout out to another podcast. Yep. All the stuff that we're now installing as regular features. God, yeah, it's fair swelling. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, in the meantime... A beast thing on the eyelid. <laughs> fucking hell. You never had that? Your eye swells like I've, fuck, man. I've like, never oh. had a beast thing. No, no, no. Sounds yeah. awful. Yeah. So uh, if you've ever been stung on the eyelid and you, uh, and you, want to, you want to talk to us about being stung on the eyelid and tell us uh, your experiences uh, or, in fact, message about anything uh, pertaining more directly to the show... There are a few <laughs> ways that you can do that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> on, uh, Facebook and Instagram. You can get us at Strong Language Violent Scenes. You can also tweet us at Strong Violent PC. And uh, you can also email Strong Language Violent Scenes at gmail.com. And remember, if you're feeling generous, your PayPal is connected to that very email address. It so you can, uh, if you ever want to chuck us a couple of quid, please do so. Yeah, I'll go mm. towards things like maybe trying to make ourselves a little bit more portable, maybe covering. Uh, hosting costs, maybe paying for medical expenses when someone's stung on the island. Aye, uh, important. Yeah. Uh, Andy, where can people listen? Yeah, well, I'm glad you asked again, Mitch. There are many, 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 many places now. Pretty much anywhere you get your podcasts. But most importantly, Spotify, yep. Stitcher, mm-hmm. Google Podcasts, yep. Podbean, Podbean, and 
Lastly, iTunes. Now, if you listen on iTunes, then please, please, I know we've said it before, but I'm going to say it again. If you can just jump onto iTunes, just leave us a wee rating, five stars. Five, five stars would be nice. Yeah. Five stars would be nice. Four's doable. Three. Uh. So thanks a lot for uh, joining us tonight, and a big thank you, of course, to uh, Mr. Chris Alexander, the editor in chief of Delirium Magazine, mm-hmm. amongst other innumerable credits. Oh God, he's a busy man. He is indeed. For uh, joining us tonight and talking Blackula, we will be back Monday morning, eight AM. And in the meantime, don't forget that it is better to die a hero than live as food in a world of chuds. Good night. You've been listening to Strong Language and Violent Scenes with Andy Stewart and Mitch Bain. Strong Language and Violent Scenes theme by Mitch Bain, production and artwork by Andy Stewart. Find us on Stitcher, iTunes and Podbean.